Hi, everybody. This is Larry Litway from Central European University, Department of Political Science. I'm talking to Elias Dinas, who is the causal inference uh, professor at European University Institute. Talking to Andrew Lee, also from Central European University, coming in from Singapore. And I'm talking to one of my favorite people, Nena Oana, talking to Derek Beach from Aarhus University. What is causality and why should we care? Right. So causality is the study of a relationship between two sets of events in which once one set of events uh, is considered to be uh, a condition for uh, the occurrence of the other set of events. Now, uh, I, I think that causality in general is... Um, is, 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 is causality is more about how we think uh, about explaining a given phenomenon, not only the way we uh, observe it, but in, the, in, but in a way that we could potentially uh, uh, be in position to sort of reproduce its existence or its occurrence um, in, in the future. Now, the, the whole part of statistical, the, the whole discussion about causality relates to the fact that it is particularly difficult to um, think about, the part thing, it's more difficult than it might, what one might think of, what one, what, what, than one might imagine with respect, you know, about how difficult it is to um, disentangle uh, or, or to establish that there is a causal relationship. In a way, one tricky thing here with causality is that causal questions are not why questions, unfortunately. In other words, when you ask, you know, you could ask what is the, um, who is the median voter, or who is the median voter, who is the median voter of, her, the, the representative voter of a radical right party, or, or you can ask, you know, who votes for the radical right? Okay, that's a descriptive question. Then you can ask why people ask vote for the radical right. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. an excellent question. Uh, and then you ask, you know, what is the effect of, let's say, a social status loss on uh, the probability of voting for the, for the radical right? That is a causal question. The first, the, the previous one, the explanatory question, unfortunately, is not causal. The idea is the same, but there is a fundamental difference. You start from X to go to Y. In other words, the causes of consequences are way more difficult to capture than the consequences of causes, unfortunately. Yeah. Think about it in a very simple statistical terms. You do not need the full R square explained in order to understand something, right? Whereas if you start from Y, you start from the outcome, you kind of have to think about everything else that also affects Y. If you start from X, you don't. You allow everything else to be there insofar as you can cut that R all that links X with all the other characteristics, which is exactly what experiments do. Experiments cut that arrow. They don't think about what else is there. They say whatever else is there, it's, it's relationship with X won't be any more um, uh, important and relevant precisely because none of these characteristics have led into uh, units, subjects, people uh, entering uh, into the treatment status or not. Uh, precisely because it is the researcher, the investigator who has decided that and when investors, investigators and researchers do that, they do that by applying the most agnostic in a way uh, mode, which is randomization. Knowing nothing about you uh, helps me predict, um, uh, would, no characteristic of yours would help predict uh, whether you end up being treated or not. Uh, and, and so that is, the reason we do that is because the fundamental, as we call it, problem of causal inference is not that we don't have enough time points, it's not that, you know, we don't have, let's say, uh, enough observations, it's that the, we need, we require something that cannot exist, which is the same unit simultaneously with it without the treatment, okay? And unless we have that, we cannot take this, the, we cannot know what the effect is, because the causal effect for whatever the treatment is on the other one. Because what is the causal effect according to that uh, logic? The causal effect is the difference between these two uh, statuses, between these two conditions, a condition of me with the treatment and the condition of me without the treatment. If I want to know whether the aspirin had any effect on my headache, I need to know whether how I feel with the aspirin and how I feel without the aspirin.
and I cannot do I don't, me versus Levy with the aspirin. That not wouldn't it wouldn't be a good uh, comparison because other things. Uh, wh- why actually would not be a very good comparison because there is heterogeneity in the treatment effects everywhere. Aspirins are not equally good for everyone. Aspirins are not equally good or equally uh, effective for me as they could be for for Levy. Uh, and the same things for, for the advertisement is not equal influential for everyone, the debate is not equal influential for everyone, precisely because there is heterogeneity, we cannot com- from the outset consider of, of units as exchangeable as comparable. Hence, we are missing part, at least part of the observation that we need, which is the same unit under the so-called counterfactual condition, the condition that we cannot observe. That we need to impute, and we impute it not necessarily at, for every unit, but for groups of units, if we start thinking about aggregating a bit the estimate, not telling exactly um, what we need for what the, the effect for a single uh, unit, we can take it if we randomize. And, randomize. and why can we do that? Because for the same reason that we run random samples. So for example, think about one uh, question. Think what is the, you know, the average, time people spend on Facebook in Florence, where I live now, okay? So you are run a sample and you get some average. Then you run, imagine running the same sample, or put it, imagine, imagine running another sample of the same population under identical conditions. You will agree with me that the, the, your best guess, your expectation, your best guess about the, the average a level of uh, time people spend on Facebook, let's say per week, is very c- going to be your best guess. Going to be that these two things are going to be the same because they both will approach the population average. That's exactly the case. So now between these two samples, to one of the two, apply the treatment. Instead of thinking about the amount of people spent uh, on Facebook, think Y zero, your potential outcome under your control. Everything that can capture everything that can capture everything else, the outcome that will be the same. And then to one of the two groups, you apply uh, the treatment. Everything else that you will see as a result, as, as, as a difference between them, can be then credibly attributed to, to that uh, uh, treatment. Of course, this, ex- this, this works in population. It doesn't work necessarily in, in, in finite samples. And that's why we may want to make some uh, sort of um, uh, diagnostic checks to see that randomization works. But that's the logic behind this. And that's why um, we did that. We do that in order to be able to impute a missing quantity, which is the quantity that we miss for the, the condition that we cannot observe of the units um, that uh, for, for who, of, of, for, of sets of units that we can otherwise observe. So because we cannot observe the same unit under two different conditions, we think that we can split them and have one of the two take the treatment or not, on ways that would not be ever um, bound to be uh, bound on uh, um, prone to selection. Precisely because it will be not prone to selection, as a result, you end up having uh, sort of this uh, equality in the potential outcomes. Not equality in the sense of the potential outcomes, but the fact that taking the treatment or not should not affect the so called, as we call the potential outcomes. When I, I, did, I wanted to avoid the term, what I mean by potential outcomes, I mean the potential conditions, the two different conditions the condition under treatment and the condition without treatment. Uh, I'm glad you didn't avoid the term. So, but obviously, randomized experiments are a luxury. Uh, and if somebody takes your class, they will learn of this approach and other approaches. Yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. yes. That's, so then what we try to do is because in a way experiments can become easy. If you have an experiment, then that's fine. Life is easy. What can you do when you don't have experiments? So we are using observational data in design-based ways that would allow us to mimic or approach experimental baseline and experimental data. Maybe different people will have different definitions of causality, right? But but uh, the way I teach it at CEU is probably one of the simplest versions. So I just uh, gave the students the three criteria of causality. So I'm sure you, you probably have heard of this. Yeah, so the first one is that this co-movement, right? So the, the cause and the effects have to move together either in the same direction or in the opposite direction. And number two, so uh, there has to be a proper time order. So in other words, that the cause has to precede the effects, right? So yeah, it, it, for example, yeah, well, it, should, it makes sense to say 
well, your father's height determines your height. You know, so your father's height is the cause and your, your height is the effect. It doesn't make sense to say, well, your, your height determines your father's height. Well, simply because that the time order is not right, right? And, and the yeah. third one is probably uh, the, the hardest to understand is this uh, non-spuriousness, right? So that means this cool movement between the cause and the effects we talked about just now should not be driven by a common third factor. Let's stop right here for a second. What is Andrew talking about? Well, historically, we would not be really testing causality in a political science study. We would take two variables that we're interested in. So we would take, let's say, let's call this A and let's call this B. And if we found any relationship, any association, any correlation, any covariation between these two variables, and our theory would say that while A is obviously influencing B, then we would find that as a causal evidence. Well, if, it, if it's associated, if there's relationship, if there's correlation, um, then, uh, then and, and our theory says that A should be causing B and not vice versa, that was good enough evidence. Now, of course, uh, the error in those ways is that they rest on very heavily the assumptions of what we theorize. Now, um, how can A and B be related to each other if there's an association between the two variables? Well, let's see. We can have A causing B, right? That would be one possibility. We could also have B causing A. Well, that's another possibility. Or we can have A causing B and then in turn B causing A. So we could have uh, this, what we call a recursive uh, relationship. So, uh, or, so we could have this like circular relationship. Um, and we can also have association between two variables, A and B, by the two not having anything to do with each other but rather there is some other variable, let's call this C, that is causing B and that is causing A. And because of that common cause, uh, we, um, we will find the relationship, an association between A and B, but that is because of a common underlying cause. And this is what we call a spurious relationship. And this is why independence of other factors, when we are looking at the association between two variables is very important. Now, uh, how, how do we get there is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a good question, basically. I mean, we can set up randomized experiments where we can rule out all other uh, possibilities. We, uh, there's, a, there's a large uh, there class of, uh, of, uh, of causal tests that, uh, that uh, use what's called a quasi-experimental design, which uses kind of creative approaches to overcome this problem. There, um, you know, you in a regression, for example, you can control for variables. Now, of course, you can never be sure you controlled for all possible Cs, but at least if you have a theoretical reason to expect that there is a spurious association, uh, which is what this would be, then, uh, then you would have to control for those C's that could be relevant. And then hopefully that you are, and hope that you're not emitting other C's that you're not controlling for that, because that is where this uh, so-called omitted variable bias comes from. So this is what Andrew's talking about. This is what a spurious relationship is. And I stopped him because I thought this was easier explained with pen and paper. Now I'll let Andrew speak a little longer now. Right. So, you know, that, that there are some classical examples of spurious correlations or relationships, such as uh, the correlation between children's shoe size and their math score, and the, the, the correlation between uh, ice cream sales and a uh, number of people die uh, due, due to drowning uh, in water. So, I mean, in these examples, you can clearly identify what is the third factor that is influencing both X and Y at the same time. All right. So, let me guess. Uh, yeah. Let me guess. Let yeah. me guess. 
it, it's yeah. summer. It's summer. Yeah, yeah. In the second <laughs> example, exactly, it's the temperature, right? So because as the temperature rises, on the one hand, people tend to consume more ice cream, but on the other hand, they were also more likely to swim in the water, and that therefore uh, leading to an increased number of drowning cases. So yes, of course. Okay. Right, so these are the probably the simplest or the, the, the most primary uh, introduction to this idea of causality, right? But you know, in, in many of these uh, summer school courses, we tend to go slightly deeper than, than that. And uh, so that's where uh, we introduce this the, the, the idea of causal inference. Okay, so, uh, and the way I do it, so when I, uh, if I were to extend that, that simple definition of causality, then I would, the, the first thing I would do is to introduce this uh, Rubin causal model approach to causality, or the RCM approach. Okay, so, um, well, it sim well it, to put it uh, in simple terms, that the RCM approach is basically a potential outcome framework. Okay, so think about this in terms of the, the, the treatment and, and the effects, right? So if uh, you, let's say you are doing a, uh, a trial for a drug or, or vaccine for this COVID-19, for example, right? So, and then uh, and you get these volunteers. So for each and every volunteer, so he or she can only be treated. In other words, he or she gets the real vaccine or the, he or she gets a placebo. Right, so you can see for each uh, subjects, there's only, although there are potentially two different outcomes, one under treatment and another one under control, but in reality, at the, as a researcher, you can only observe one of them, right? Because it is not possible for this uh, volunteer to be treated and untreated at the same time. Okay, so I mean, yes. yeah, so that, that's the very fundamental idea of this Rubin causal model, which is really a potential outcome ap approach. So we can only observe one of the two potential outcomes. Yeah, so that then, uh, in fact, then all these uh, techniques that we introduce in these uh, summer school courses or methods courses are to overcome this, um, what, what this fundamental problem of causal inference. Okay, so yeah, I know I just uh, introduced this term. So it's basically that problem I just talked about, right? So it's not possible for a single subject to be treated and untreated at the same time. And that is known as the fundamental problem of causal inference. And, so uh, yeah. how can we overcome this problem? Because obviously the, the model is pointing to some solution, right? Yeah, exactly. So then, well, as for solution, so, uh, well, it, so in some way, it also depends on if you are a natural scientist or a social scientist. I think as a natural scientist, that the, that the solution is probably easier. So that problem is easier to solve because you, in, in many uh, natural science cases, you can uh, easily assume, uh, for example, temporal stability. Okay, or you can assume this causal transients, right? So that, that well, if you, let's say, for example, if uh, temporal stability holds, yeah, then you can um, surely, you can, let's say, vaccinate this person for real for the first time, and then give him or her a placebo the next time, right? Because then uh, by the assumption of uh, temporal stability, then you can observe that the causal effects. Right, but mm -hmm. as you can see in this case, for human beings, it doesn't work, right? Even for medical yeah. science, it cannot work. All right, and so sometimes we can also uh, assume this causal transients. So that means that the exposure to the, to the treatment uh, is not affected by prior exposure to the same treatment. But again, with human beings, that can never be true. Yeah, with natural substance like water, I don't know, or carbon dioxide, that may be true. But, but with human beings, again, it cannot never be true. Yeah, especially, you know, if you deal with children, for example, yeah, you know, this uh, causal transients, yeah, well, it's, uh, oh, sorry. So that example is probably more applicable to temporal stability. Yeah, you know, with children, so temporal stability can never be true. Right, so this behavior will be different each and every time the, ch the child gets treated. So, I mean, these, yeah, these are a lot of, uh, so some, but 
for, for natural science, sometimes, yeah, you can uh, rely on these assumptions, right? But for social scientists like us, the, the, the thing is, uh, the problem is slightly more complicated. So uh, that brings us to, actually brings me to this, uh, this, what we call the statistical solution to the fundamental problem of causal inference, right? So the, the thing is, since we cannot really observe uh, the, the causal effect with one individual, right? So then the, the, how we do is that we bring this to the group level, right? So that's how where this classical experiment template comes from. So we have two groups that look uh, very, very similar to each other, right? Then we subject one group to a treatment and another group uh, as the control group, then in this case, we compare the average. We can compare the average differences between the two groups. Okay, then and, and that uh, so that the estimate for that, um, yeah, and, and that that average difference is actually an estimate of the causal effects, and that's the very fundamental concept what we call uh, the ATE, right? So that the average treatment effects. So you really, yeah, that's how I would introduce this idea of causality and causal inference to motivate yeah, our study of, let's say, experimental design, and of course, later uh, causal mediation analysis, which is uh, even more complicated than that. All right, so, so, so tell me how, how, how somebody coming from the, from the qualitative uh, case-based world thinks about, uh, thinks about causality. So yeah, first of all, um, to start with, I think the debate about causality in QCA is not fully settled. It's some aren't contested, but I'm gonna talk about the parts that are settled. And uh, first of all, uh, I want to make this distinction between token level and type level causation, because I yeah. think a lot of people who take QCA coming from the case-based world world uh, process tracing are used to this kind of token level causation, which are actually claims about the causal relationship in particular events or cases. Whereas uh, one should understand that QCA, it's based on a type level causation. So it's a cross case method. Uh, okay. It looks, uh, it basically aims at finding causation across uh, multiple cases and defines causations as relationship between classes of cases and classes of events. So we're definitely looking at type level causation, even if we're uh, talking about the case-based method, it's still mm -hmm. about classes of cases and relationships between those. Um, then QCA looks at patterns of uh, necessity and sufficiency. Um, okay. In principle, such patterns, when they're verbally stated, they usually fall under uh, a regularity type of causation in the sense that you need to observe. So a necessary condition uh, is there whenever the necessary condition is there, the outcome is always there. So you need to observe that across uh, all your cases or multiple times regularly. That's why, however, in applied QCA, especially in social science, we allow uh, degrees of departing with that, for that uh, from that and parameters of fit. So relationships, this kind of associations uh, are not, um, they don't always need to be perfect in applied research practice. And then claims are also toned down. So just like in regression, association does not always mean causation. And we need to be aware of that in QCA as well. So the pure uh, necessity and sufficiency patterns that we observed do not automatically translate into causal pattern. Uh, and for this reason, um, one thing that uh, QCA practitioners uh, suggest is going back to cases and doing uh, set theoretic multi-method research in order to substantiate, substantiate and instantiate uh, 
the cross case uh, level patterns that we observed with we observed with QCA with mechanistic evidence from within case analysis or comparative case studies. And this is actually a whole area of research, set theoretic multi-method research, which is also part nowadays from most uh, QCA uh, uh, courses. Uh, but going back one step, perhaps from this very abstract discussion um, about regularity and type level causation, another thing that I wanted to stress in this discussion is uh, causal complexity. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because I think this kind of look on uh, causation at a less abstract level differentiates QCA a bit in the, uh, let's say, cross-case observational <laughs> analysis mm -hmm. field. Um, the fact that it looks at causally complex patterns and um, that's uh, defined for QCA researchers by three characteristics. So okay. uh, it most of the times thinks that causality is conjunctural. It's rarely that conditions or variables or sets uh, lead to the outcome uh, on their own. It's usually co complex combinations of these conditions that lead to the outcome. So we have uh, what uh, in QCA is called INUS conditions, conditions which are insufficient on their own, but they're necessary part of an insufficient, uh, of an unnecessary but sufficient combinations of condition. That only means that um, conditions combine to be sufficient for the outcome. Okay. For example, to give you an example, let's say one study successful protest, uh, it's rarely, let's say, the numbers alone would uh, lead to a protest being successful. It's usually you would think of combinations. It's numbers combined with media visibility, combined with political allies, that leads to successful protest. It's never political allies alone, media visibility alone, or numbers alone. So conditions rarely produce an outcome on their own. So, okay, and, so my problem with this has always been that I come from the potential outcomes framework and, and, um, and it, I mean, this frame, this this approach still only gives me some kind of association. Granted, the complexity is appealing because you need to have certain things happening at the same time to get an outcome. But is that really causality would be the critique from the potential outcomes framework. Is it possible that it's the outcome causing these conditions? So, so, so reverse causality is not ruled out in this instance. Sure. Well, uh, you would still need to have a temporal ordering of this. Uh, you would assume mm -hmm. that the conditions happened before the outcome. That's why I said about combining, you would still think about these different conditions combined INSs as difference makers. That's mm -hmm. why uh, we also we also combine QCA with case studies to see whether taking one of these INSs away uh, makes the outcome go away, whether these INSs are difference makers. So uh, you would have all of these elements of top that on top that would um, strengthen your claim. So just observing the associations between, in this case, between the combinations of the three conditions and the outcome, as I said, would not uh, instantly mean uh, causation. You would need to substantiate it with all of this. And you would have to have a theory and probably a theory on mechanisms as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, of course. But um, I mean, when this, when this critique hit uh, the quantitative world, it was that, that we have established causality through theory and then we tested it with correlational methods. And now they say that's not enough. That's not good enough. We need to have causal leverage somehow. Uh, and and of course, there's a large number of various approaches to to establish that um, that you would if you ever take a causal inference class uh, from this quantitative counterfactual framework that people would go through. But uh, but it it really sounds like what you're describing is where 
the 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 quant world was coming from historically uh, though i don't know how to deal with the complexity side of things because because is is one outcome causing the complexity on one side that, that's uh uh that is that is compelling that there might be something there that we should be paying attention perhaps to, to go one step step back with this uh, i think mm -hmm. um there's also a misunderstanding of qca as uh, a means of hypothesis testing so compared mm -hmm. to the old uh, let's say uh, <laughs> regression statistical field qca does not aim at uh, having a hypothesis generated from theory and testing that with the data at hand. So think of QCA more as a theory building exercise, as a theory evaluation mm -hmm. exercise. That's why the cross case patterns that we observed in QCA are not immediately interpreted as causal, but they are means of um, refining our theories and redefining them. So uh, in QCA, you rarely test hypotheses precisely because of these limitations but rather you evaluate hypotheses based on the new cross-case evidence that you generate. And that's mm -hmm. why um, you don't necessarily establish causality through QCA or test this hypothesis. And at the end, the result is, okay, is my theory true or not true? But rather you evaluate these theories and say, okay, I need to restrict my theory a bit or introduce, I, I realized I have an omitted variable bias. I realized I uh, mistaken the relationship between these two that always go together. So think of it as a theory building exercise rather than a hypothesis testing exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I, when I was talking about causality, more in the hypothesis testing part, I was uh, going more towards this a SMMR, set theoretic multi-method research, in which you need to substantiate your cross-case evidence with evidence on uh, difference making, on the difference making on the finances, evidence on, on mechanisms. So just learning QCA will not, uh, just like just learning regression or how to do correlations would probably not tell you much about uh, causality. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so anything else comes to mind that we should build on this? Yeah, uh, I wanted to continue with this discussion of causal complexity because I think be, uh, beyond conjunctural causations, there's two more interesting aspects. And one is equifinality and interesting in this theory building way. One is equifinality. So um, in QCA, you think of multiple ways of uh, getting to an outcome of interest. So uh, rather than having... Um, a model that uh, has an R square and explains everything the same way across all cases. In QCA, we deal with types of cases and each of them might have their own unique uh, explanation, but it's still a class of cases. So it's still cross case. And another interesting aspect is a symmetry. So uh, we usually have um, different explanations for the occurrence of a phenomena than for the non-occurrence of a phenomena. So we do conceive of uh, the occurrence and the non-occurrence of a phenomena as two different phenomena in their own right that deserve separate explanations rather than conceiving of um, outcomes as linear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So, so equifinality would be if uh, condition A, B, and C occur together, then we're going to get this outcome. Or if conditions, you know, F, G, and H uh, occur together, we're going to get this outcome. So th th that's that's what you mean by that. And asymmetry is uh, is that if A, B, and C occur together, we're going to get this outcome. But if A, B, and C doesn't occur, then we're not going to get the opposite necessarily. That yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. All right. Um, how, how, so, how would you tie that in with causality? Is that, is that? As I said, I think, <laughs> I mean, it still works in this INAS uh, way of causality because this, mm -hmm. uh, basically these features of causal complexity, they're, they're all based on this INAS that I was talking about. So mm -hmm. equifinality also means that a single condition does not produce the same effect on the outcome 
but only depending on its context. And that's why you have equifinality because we have you have different contexts. And then each features of the context could be difference makers on their own. Mm -hmm. And um, a symmetry also comes from the way of uh, conceptualizing our sets. The fact that we consider different kinds of cases rather than study linear properties on cases. So we look at different qualitative kinds of cases. But again, uh, I think it, at the poor, pure cross case level evidence. Um, again, uh, this is rarely used for hypothesis testing, but more as it is called in the QCA world, theory evaluation and uh, mm -hmm. theory building. So, um, so, okay, so, so last question. So the cross case evidence, uh, then let's think of it for, from the causality point of view. You say we need to follow this up by uh, by uh, by a reevaluation empirically. Would that reevaluation happen also cross case or within case? So how how does the cross case finding travel to a within case world, or or um, or, or it doesn't? <laughs> and then yeah. Well, ideally you would have uh, both. So uh, ideally you would have the cross case evidence in, uh, to go a step back. The evidence travels quite well because of the nature of QCA of um, working with sets and types of cases and uh, working with these theories of sufficiency and necessity, which translate very well to the case-based uh, world. Uh, now, ideally, in order to substantiate such a cross case claim at the single, at the within case level or comparative within case level, you will need a multitude of within case uh, case studies. You will mm -hmm. need to study typical cases to see whether your theory of the mechanisms hold in those typical cases. You will need to study uh, deviant cases to see why they depart from your pattern. You will need to compare typical cases in which everything worked fine with what we call individually irrelevant cases. These cases where just one of the INAS is missing uh, and the outcome went away to see whether it's exactly the absence of the mechanisms hypothesized by you that it's missing. So there are several um, relevant case studies that one can do, each of them having their own analytical goal, that taken together in a perfect world where we would have perfect resources, if you would do all of these separate case studies to fulfill all of the different analytical goals, you probably would have, could have a stronger claim on causality. However, mm -hmm. it's a matter of uh, approaching and substantiating as good as you can, obviously, because a lot of times we don't have the resources to follow up QCA with all of this multitude of case studies. Yeah, no, I mean, the reason I asked is because I know for the process tracing crowd, this is, uh, this is a, <clears throat> a big question always. So how do you transition from, from cross case evidence for, to within case evidence? And this is, uh, um, I know if I think of Derek Beach, this this seems to be on his mind uh, all the time, all day, all days of the week, <laughs> and, and it sometimes comes up in conversation often. But it seems like uh, from a QCA point of view, this transition is uh, quite natural and is mostly limited by uh, resources that it's so hard to do within case analysis. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And that's because we uh, we deal with types of cases. Uh, the relationships are nonlinear. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't talk about uh, the types of patterns observed uh, are not uh, interpreted from a probability view of uh, causation. So not observing something in a case, it's not, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, passed on. Yeah. To, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be an absence of the outcome, right? Yeah, exactly. So, what what are the unsettled debates in in QCA about causality? Can you just give us a taster? Yeah, well, exactly this: whether we're talking about regularity or not. 
and mm -hmm. uh, whether these patterns can be thought as pure regularity and deterministic if we were to have obviously a perfect case selection and work with the universe of cases and or whether we're talking about different types of causation not mm -hmm. only regularity whether we can um, allow for deviations from perfect patterns and we can move more more toward probabilistic patterns so i guess there's uh, all sorts of view in the qca world about this <laughs> and that's why i didn't want to point to just one of them mm -hmm. well i mean it's okay for first you have to you have to start somewhere and then we can go exactly that. and uh i think it's best to stress this theory building exercise because that's what we do a lot in social science as well we do analysis in order to come up with improved theories that we then perhaps assess again and we keep on uh, improving so i wanted to stress this element of qca that so uh, so andrew what is causal mediation Right, so well, I, I would say in one sentence, so causal mediation is really to unpack that black box of causality, right? So just to give you a little bit of background information. So, I mean, you are probably familiar with a lot of methods and techniques that are designed to uh, evaluate the causal effects, right? So the causal effect of X on Y, right? But uh, as social scientists, very often, we are not just interested in the causal effects of X on Y, but how does that effect operate, right? So, I mean, if you think about any social science theory, uh, all, almost all theories would explicitly uh, specify a particular causal mechanism through which just the cause X affects the, the, the outcome Y. Right. So, I mean, but so far, most of these techniques we have been dealing with, well, take this black box approach to causality. So, and the causal mediation is, uh, well, I would say a set of techniques that help us to uncover, to unpack that black box and to really put that causal mechanism into test. So that, that's uh, like my, my simple answer to uh, what is causal mediation analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so uh, how does it work? Like, what, what's, the, <laughs> what's what's the approach? Sure, and uh, yeah. So in fact, um, that, in fact, my my course, uh, causal mediation analysis, is really organized or motivated by that that question. How does it work? So the way I designed this course is to see it as a multi method uh, course, right? So. Oh, I, I wouldn't use the term mixed method. Okay, so for example, well, it would be too too much debatable right, to say if you can really mix, uh, let's say, process tracing with experimental design. Yeah, so there are too much controversies there. So, well, but so I wouldn't call it a mixed method, but a multi-method uh, approach to causal mediation. So, well, in that course, if you take that course, you would learn at least uh, three different approaches to unpack that black box. So, and uh, th the first one uh, is uh, is a, a, in fact a classic or qualitative uh, methods called process tracing. So, I'm sure uh, Professor Derek Beach, who is an expert in that. He may, might have already talked to you, so I probably won't go too deep into that. But uh, well, what? But what if you're a quantitative researcher? Okay, so I mean, uh, uh, quantitative researchers are often uh, criticized for ignoring uh, this causal mechanism because, yeah, so it has been a common belief that quantitative methods are not good, yeah, at this uh, at testing this uh, causal mechanism. So. Uh, but if you're a quantitative researcher or experimentalist, so well, my course would offer you two uh, solutions to that, right? So, and both both uh, both solutions are in fact based on a common understanding or or a very fundamental assumption, what we call a, the sequential ignorability, right? So. Now you can see to, to unpack the black box. So we really have to identify at least one mediator that lies somewhere on the causal pathway. So it's not just X and Y alone anymore, but say X, M and Y. So M is what we call the mediator that operates 
yeah, these effects of x on y. So now when you have these three variables, okay, so what are the assumptions re regarding uh, the, the relationship between them? So the first one, so this sequential ignorability is actually made of two parts, right? So the, the, the first one, the first part is actually uh, the, 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 the standard independence assumption, all right? So which is uh, given these uh, observed uh, pretreatment confounders, so the treatment assignments is assumed to be ignorable or random that is statistically independent of the potential outcomes and uh, potential mediators. So th that's a very standard uh, independence assumption. Okay, so in fact, a classical experimental template is designed to guarantee uh, this assumption will hold, right? But the, the second part is probably more difficult to understand and also more difficult to achieve in real empirical research. So the second part of this uh, sequential ignorability he basically says, the observed mediator is ignorable given the actual treatment status and the pretreatment confounders. So this is the one that is most tricky. Yeah. So uh, and even a single, uh, uh, well, a, a classical experimental template will not guarantee that this part will hold. So that's why, uh, what, let's say, when we test a causal mechanism experimentally. Yeah, so we need really some special experimental designs beyond the classical template or what we call the standard design. Okay, so you may have things like the parallel design, okay, or the co crossover design or parallel encouragement design. So th things like that. So uh, it, it's, there are additional steps yeah, in this experimental design that is to, to make sure uh, the second part of the sequential ignorability will hold. Okay, so that's the experimental like solution to, to this problem. And then if you are an observational studies uh, a scholar, right, or you, 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 uh, you carry out your study using observational data, then we have uh, this, then we have this uh, basically structural equation framework. So it all starts with, yeah, the, 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 the works, the, the foundational works of Barron and Kenny, and then only around the turn of, no, not really the turn of the century, but around 2010, yeah, a group of uh, scholars at Princeton University really re refined that framework and uh, came up with this general algorithm, okay, that can be applied to any source of variables, not just continuous, but also binary and uh, ordinal. Right, so I mean, it, the, the thing is with these observational studies, yeah, so uh, because researchers do not have uh, control over the data generating process, then both parts of the sequential ignorability uh, can be potentially violated. Okay, but uh, the, the thing is, well, there's nothing we can do with that, right? Because we don't control the, the data generating process, but to address that problem, then we have this uh, technique called sensitivity analysis. So basically we can quantify the degree to which this uh, assumption of sequential ignorability has to be violated before our original conclusion is reversed. Okay, so I don't know if that makes sense. So that means if our analysis is very sensitive, yeah, then you know it, it, it very much it critically hinges on sequential ignorability, but otherwise probably you are safer yeah, because that the, the, this assumption has to be violated to a larger degree before you need to reverse your original conclusion. Yeah. So now yeah. that everybody has some perspective on what uh, what uh, causality is from the point of view of an experimentalist, I want to ask Derek what causality is because he has a very different and I believe valuable perspective. Derek? Yeah, so um, some people believe that, that there's kind of one, one way of thinking about causation, right? This is um, a very, there's in particular one, a very influential, I can actually just take you over and pull it out. Uh, this book by, uh, by Woodward uh, about, and this is kind of the Bible of counterfactual uh, thinking. Um, and 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 basically, what Woodward says is that 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 cause causation is equal to counterfactuals. Um, 
And so a counterfactual, of course, how do I know a cause is a cause? Well, it's by the absence produces the absence of the, of the outcome. Well, there's other philosophers that say, well, okay, that's great. That's, a, that's a, a good way of thinking about causation, but that's not the only kind of causal claim we be, might be making. And that's not the only way of thinking about causation. And there's a long theory, uh, philosophical uh, debate going back at least to Descartes about this, these topics, but here we'll cut to the chase and say that the other position is that is what you could call a mechanistic or a productive account. And this is basically saying is that a counterfactual is what you could call a, there's a dependency relationship. And, and the, the causation in is, is that the variation of one produces variation, so difference making, right? And that's the core of the causal claim. That's, that's cool. It's a, it, and, and, it, and, and it's an ontological belief, right? So that means there's no right or wrong answer. This is metaphysics, you can't test it. I mean, Woodward claims that meta, you know, th this is the only way to go. But others, and in particular within a, a more critical realist understanding of science would say, well, that's not the only way to think about causation. That, that causation can also be that there is a process, a mechanism, but a process unbroken linking a cause and an outcome together. And if I really want to know whether A is, is you know, how, how A is linked to B and, and there's a causal relationship, well, I need to follow the money. I need to trace the process. So using an example, you could do an experiment and expose rats to uh, smoke, you know, cigarette smoke, and then investigate the difference that makes for, for you know, lung cancer. Um, or you could do the process tracing, which is what they did in medicine, was actually taking rats and observing, observing the process, observing each part of the process, not in form of an experiment, but basically like exposing the rat, you know, and, and then watching the different, the mucus producing and the cell ch changes and actually observing it. And so making a causal inference about a process or a mechanism linking the two is another way of thinking about causation. So let me share a slide with you. What they would say in the philosophy of science um, is, is, is this, in this kind of explanation, you're asking a how it works question. You're asking about the linkages and that is enabling you to make a causal inference, but of a different sort. It's not a net causal effects. It's a how does it work kind of, there's a process. And, and what they would talk about would be something like to be able to actually make a strong causal claim, your theory and the evidence you have for it has to have what we would call productive continuity. So there's basically no significant holes in your causal mechanism. And then the critical thing about your theorization would be the activities. So what entities in our instance in the social sciences, this, sciences, this would be either you know, people, individual voters or, or a politician. It could be macro level entities like a political party that cannot just be decomposed to its individual parts. It has what we call is a macro level entity that has emergence, it can do things as, as, a, as a collective actor. States can go to war. Um, but the critical part of your causal claim is the activities and you're making the causal logics linking the parts very explicit. So um, in, a, in a quite influential book about mechanistic explanations in the natural sciences by Craver and Darden, they talk about kind of what would not be a good mechanistic explanation. And this I think also illustrates the difference between thinking about well, often how we talk about mechanisms in the social sciences, but also the difference between maybe a, an intervening variable, because intervening variables have to vary and we compare them across cases. Here, so a superficial mechanistic explanation would be basically you say, well, we have a cause like grievances, and then maybe there's some kind of collective action mechanism that produces a democratic transition, right? A somebody from this kind of mechanistic uh, understanding of causation would say, okay, that's really not a very good mechanistic explanation. It's not a good causal claim because you haven't told me how it works. Like what, what are people doing? 
how does collective action, what are, you know, is this mobilization of trade unions and, and how do they interact with the government and why would the government give in on, on, on and actually accept democratization, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a superficial mechanistic explanation. An incomplete mechanistic explanation would be something like you have a cause and then you might have entities, but you don't, un, you don't explain and evidence the activities or the linkages you know, voter does this, that leads a politician to do that and, and explicate the causal logics linking the two. So a good mechanistic explanation basically tries to really unpack each part of this, of this, of this process and, and explain to us then how I get from, 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 from A to B. I would say one of the one of the most revealing things that uh, well you you said to me when we were discussing this is is if you take this view of of uh, causality and uh, and causation how you select your cases is not the same way you would select from an experimental point of view. I mean, if you if you take this experimental logic, but even correlational logic, the first thing they they tell you is do not select your cases on the dependent variable, right? You would yeah. you would select it randomly, or you would select it well at, maybe from a case studies point of view, maybe on the independent variable, but never on the dependent variable. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I would say um, you know. Why should I study how smoking causes cancer in non-smokers? What is that going to tell me about the process? Or, you know, why should I go moose hunting in New York, right? I'm not going to see any moose in New York. Well, I could go to the zoo, I guess, but I'd probably be arrested. Um, is, is the idea is that you select cases where um, you're interested in how it works. Right? You're not interested in a net causal effects kind of claim. You're interested in, like, how do I get from A to B? So if I'm interested in how, how uh, you know, some kind of grievances produce a uh, policy, uh, a democratic transition, I would want to select a case where both were present because I want, I, want to, I want to explore what's going on in between. And I don't necessarily, when I select my case, know how it works. That's why I'm doing the research. But I the, the, the logic is very different, is, is that you're selecting just like in, an, in a lab experiment, if you were if, or, or in the lab, if you're studying smoking cancer, the experiment, of course, would do the variation in control group, whereas the process tracing variant of that would be, no, I want to take, uh, take a rat and I want to expose them to a lot of smoke over a long period of time and observe the difference, not, not no, sorry, not the difference, but the process that's producing lung cancer. Um, and of course, we do it on rats because, you know, for obvious ethical reasons. Um, but I would not study that, learn about how smoking produces cancer by, you know, taking a healthy rat and just letting it run around and, 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 and play. You know, I'd, I'd unfortunately put it through a lot of pain if, if I was that doing that kind of research. Um, and, and that's the difference, right, is, the, is that, is that um, you know, something like process tracing, you're, you're selecting what we would call positive or typical cases, that, that this, is, this is where this relationship, in theory at least, could, could have taken place, and then you investigate how, how it works. At later, once you understand how it typically works, then one type of deviant case becomes very relevant. So let me just use an example from, from a, a, a PhD scholar I had uh, who did a really nice uh, dissertation. He was interested in the linkage between how issue linkage as a, as a concept and, and kind of the, the, all the things that, that the distribution of preferences, et cetera, in climate change negotiations, how that could produce a, like a good efficient outcome is the term we use in negotiation theory. And he investigated that process, like how did issue linkage work in two negotiations? So the Kyoto Protocol and the Montreal uh, Convention and found you know, the different activities and what leaders were doing to put forward and how they were received and all these kind of things, a really nice, nice theory. And then once he had a good idea of how it worked, it was like, oh, I want to investigate a case where it should have worked and it did not. So this is a deviant case, but a deviant case where this cause should have worked. 
the same distribution of preferences was, was, and the mechanism or the process was working and chugging along pretty well until at one point the Danish uh, presidency tabled a proposal. This is the COP15 that ended up with a catastrophic Copenhagen summit, tabled a proposal and everybody went away screaming and we got a, a dysfunctional inefficient outcome. So once you understand the typical, then the deviant case like that can be a case that you can use to understand like under what conditions, like what ha also has to be present for this process to work in this way. And so what, what, what uh, Henrik found out was the leader had to be perceived as relatively not neutral, but at least acceptable for everybody. And the Danes were not, uh, and, and that led to a catastrophic you know, crash and burn. But it was only also by understanding the typical first that the deviant case then became interesting for further theoretical refinement and development. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so this is a different view of causality than uh, what you would get from, uh, from well, most of political science, but it answers a slightly different question and it potentially has value. So, uh, Anything to add before we wrap up? Well, it's it's. I would say, yeah, it's it's a different way of answering uh, answering, or it's a different question you're answering. And there's actually a lot of demand for this kind of research right now. Um, you know, in policy studies, for example, there's there's a lot of the more prominent scholars saying, yeah, there's all these things that we have kind of theorized, but we really don't know how it actually works. Um, and, and so these kind of methods are increasingly gaining traction as, as also a, a nice publication strategy um, is, is being able to answer another type of question than, 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 you know, just what's the variation. It's like, how does this actually work? And, and you know, what is the linkage in between? Uh, so so it's, it's, it's answering a different question, the how it works question. But sometimes it's a good idea to understand a little bit about how things work in the real world, instead of maybe the more counterfactual base, like how could it have been different? Because uh, you know the process tracer would say, well, I'm not interested in what could have happened in counterfactual worlds. I want to know what actually happened in Brazil or in Brussels at this time, uh, at, at this place. So, so it's a it's a it's a different approach, uh, answering different questions, but but uh, it definitely has a has a valuable place in political science. Yeah, and if this is appealing for anybody listening, then uh, the process tracing course is probably where you want to start, right? That could be, or or a broader uh, case case study course uh, that that kind of takes you around different different uh, different variants. But yes, something like like an introduction to process tracing, and and case based methods more broadly uh, would would be where to start.